Hi, everyone. This is your host, Ken Fiedernick, and today you're going to meet an extraordinary person, Bobby Glass. Bobby is a 72-year-old transgender woman who teaches courses in special education at the University of Cumberland, Kentucky. If you've never spoken with a transgender person, and no matter what your views are about transgender people, you'll want to hear Bobby's amazing story growing up in a small Appalachian town in Virginia, raising four children, and then becoming a mentor for countless students, and often their parents who have experienced versions of the challenges she has experienced during her life. Bobby, I would like to welcome you to Courageous Conversations about our schools. Thank you. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, Ken. Thank you. Well, great. Well, thanks so much for offering to share your personal story with me and our listeners and, and your perspectives on some of the controversies surrounding school policies that are being adopted across the country affecting trans students. And I, I just want to note to our listeners that the views that you express are are your own and not necessarily those of your employer at the at the university. But Bobby, uh, talk a little bit about where you live now and what you do. I live in Louisville, Kentucky, and I've been there uh, longer than I've ever been anywhere in my life. Uh, I am openly transgender. For the last 20-some years, I've had two full-time jobs. I've, uh, I'm a university professor. I train teachers trying to get licensed uh, to work with children in exceptional child education, and I am um, beginning my 47th year uh, of uh, my career in exceptional child education and working with neurodivergent people, uh, um, people whose brains and bodies are wired outside of the norm so much that they qualify for special things like special education or vocational rehabilitation, uh, supported living, supported housing, those kinds of things because uh, their brains and bodies are just wired outside the norm. And so I've been doing that every day for 47 years. And for the last 20, though, uh, 20 some, um, I've, I've, uh, I've been training teachers, working on their licenses. Uh, and I've, I'm, gosh, I've trained over 7,800 teachers now. I've had to spend at least eight weeks with me on their way to get those licenses. And then I also, um, I uh, teach full-time for the, the Jefferson County Public Schools in Louisville. Um, about several years ago, you know, 47 years, it was like I was getting, starting to get a little burned out. And I thought, um, I, I, want the ki- I want the toughest kids. I want the kids that are going to challenge everything I've learned and everything I've experienced. That's where I want to go. Okay, let me provide some background about this issue. And then we will get back to Bobby. So I'm sure many of you know, controversies around transgender rights are raging across the country. Heated debates are happening in virtually every state over the bathrooms transgender students can use, what sports teams they can play on, and whether educators should inform parents if their students are using names and pronouns that do not match their students' birth gender. A growing number of states, including Alabama, North Carolina, and Indiana, and many school districts across the country have passed laws forcing the outing of transgender youth. CBS News recently ran a story about a transgender student from Virginia named Betty Thomas. This is what Betty's mom said about school policies that were adopted back in 2021 by Virginia's former governor, Ralph Northam, to support the state's transgender students. Now our teachers, our principals, our counselors get the training and the information that they need in order to accommodate kids like Betty. But policies affecting transgender students changed when Glenn Youngkin was elected governor in 2022. But it's also led to a very serious backlash. Current Governor Republican Glenn Youngkin's administration has proposed its own policy that has protections against discrimination and bullying, but would require parental permission to change names or pronouns at school and would require students use bathrooms that correspond to their sex assigned at birth. The move has led to a heated public debate. Calling these heated debates is an understatement. Here's an angry parent 
in another state telling members of a school board what he thinks is happening in their schools, not just about gender or identity, but also about race. You're teaching children to hate others because of their skin color, and you're forcing them to lie about other kids' gender. Part of the problem is that discussions in school board meetings or in state houses about transgender policies are seldom really discussions at all because people aren't really listening to each other. When culture wars erupt and people are driven by outrage, there are simply no opportunities for people to learn, to question their own thinking, to consider other points of view. They just end up yelling louder. They dig their heels in more firmly. And that is often the beginning of a death spiral for schools. Dedicated board members, administrators, and teachers quit. And replacements are hard to find. After all, who would want to work in a district consumed by toxic polarization? And school leaders find it hard to tend to the normal business of running schools. Who ultimately pays the price for this? Students, of course. But as Americans, we all pay a price when adults are unwilling or unable to listen and to have civil conversations about their schools. So it occurred to me recently that while most everyone I talk to has an opinion about transgender people, most of us have never actually spoken with one. So that's why I reached out to Bobby Glass, so we could hear her story and get her perspectives about some of the policies affecting transgender students and their parents. I guarantee that you will learn things you didn't already know, and I think you will be surprised by some of Bobby's perspectives. I know this was true for me. So that's what we will do in this part one of the episode. In part two, we're going to hear from Don Allen, a parent of two young children who lives in Florida. Don spoke out recently at a local school board meeting and is sympathetic to some of the new policies related to parent rights and transgender students. That school board meeting made national news because it was partly about a teacher named Jenna Barbie, who quit after a state investigation was launched into her showing a Disney movie called Strange World. And in the third and final episode of this series, Bobby and Don will have a conversation with each other after they've listened to what each other has said in parts one and two. This will actually be a discussion, not a debate, where two people with different perspectives and life experiences have agreed to listen and to try to understand one another, and even to see if they might find some common ground. So let's get back to Bobby Glass and hear her story and her perspectives on what's going on in our schools. We're going to get into some of the policies, that perhaps the ones that have been adopted or may be adopted in Kentucky, but it's happening across the country, including in my state of California and several districts have recently uh, enacted new policies uh, that we'll talk about a little later. But I, one of the reasons I, I wanted to talk with you and I wanted our listen, listeners to hear from you is that I think many people who have formed opinions about transgender people have not ever, at least knowingly, spoken or heard a story from someone who was trans, transgender. And if you would, I uh, I would love for you to to go back and just, you know, sort of briefly, I, I'm sure you could take uh, a long time because I'm sure it's complicated and interesting, but talk a little bit about your own personal story growing up and, and the events or the what led up to you transitioning and what that was like. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, and that's one of the reasons I do what I do, because transgender and intersex people are, are, their birth rate is six out of a thousand, less than one percent, six tenths of a percent. So six out of a thousand people are born transgender. That means 994 out of a thousand are wired pretty much. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe their sexual attraction will be a little off. But for the most part, their brains and their what's between their ears and what's between their legs are in, in perfect agreement. And they can't imagine that it's just not like that for everybody. And so that's why I agree with you. Most people do not know a transgender person. No, most people have never had uh, a sincere conversation with a transgender person. And 
And it's like, well, I'm a pretty good one for you to get to know. So uh, let me get out there and do that. Uh, so uh, I, w- I was born in 1950, uh, 72 years ago, in a little Appalachian coal mining town in Virginia. Uh, that town to this day has never had more than 5,000 people. I can't think, of, oh, that's going to be a great thing if we go. No, it's always been real around 4,000, never got close to 5,000, really. Um, the uh, closest four-lane highway when I was a kid was 60 miles away. So it's just, yeah, I want you to imagine coal country, two-lane highways, very mountainous, very isolated, and 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 nobody knew anything. <laughs> uh, I didn't know anything about it. I just, from my earliest memories, I knew I was a girl. So when you think about, well, when do children start forming memories? Three, four years old, somewhere around there. I don't have a day in my life where I didn't know I was a girl. I uh, was interested in all the girl stuff. I wanted to be uh, my. I had a sister. I wanted. I want. I wanted to be with her and her friends and all this stuff. I was just attracted to that. And very early on, I, you know, it's oh no, you're not going to play with your sister's dolls. Uh, these are your toys. You're not going to play with that. Or I'd be trying on my mom's clothes or my sister. No, 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 no. <laughs> don't do that. Uh, you can't do that. And uh, my parents, uh, we, my dad was a pharmacist. We owned a drugstore. And my, my mom and dad were, it was open seven days a week. And so they were gone most of the time. And so my, my sister's eight years older. My brother's six years older. And they pretty much were, would tease me into compulsory masculinity. That's pretty much what it was. It was like, no. And, and then if I was messing with, if I'm, if I wouldn't quit messing with my sister's dolls, then she was going to tell on me and they were real expensive. And, you know, I shouldn't be doing this. You know, I, I I wanted to please my parents and I wanted to fit in, but it was, I, I didn't understand what the big deal was. Uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to leave my sister's dolls alone. I didn't want to leave uh, my mom and her clothes alone. I wanted to sing uh, girl songs that we heard on the radio. You know, there's, there's you know, Debbie Reynolds and all of these people back in those days. I wanted to sing their songs and I would have to go hide somewhere so I could sing these girl songs because I knew I was going to get teased if anybody heard me singing these girl songs. And, uh, and so by the time I'm five or six years old, I'm becoming a serial liar, sneaking around to, 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 to kind of fulfill this need that nobody wants me to fulfill. And, uh, my, uh, Oh, I just adore my dad. I cannot tell you how much I adore my father. Uh, and he tried so hard teaching me how to play football and baseball. <laughs> I was just always getting hurt. I was no good at it, no good at all. And uh, not interested even a little bit. Well, when I started school, uh, I was I was good at school. And I remember the first report card I brought home, uh, my dad sat me in his lap. And uh, we looked at my report card and Every A I had on my report card, he reached into his pocket and gave me a silver dollar. Uh, and it was like, wow, I like that. <laughs> silver dollars was the coolest thing in the world. And, so, and, and it was like, it was, and it was like, oh my gosh, now this is something I can do well. Uh, I could, I could compete academically. I could, I could do that stuff. And so I did. I was valedictorian of my high school. I graduated with distinction from Duke University. I went on to earn three master's degrees and a doctorate and across three master's degrees and a doctorate, I have a 4.0 average. Mm. That's oh. the way my high masculinity went. It was like, I can do this. I cannot play baseball to this day. I can't catch. I can't hit. Uh, I get a little bit of root football, but not much. Uh, but but I could, the academic stuff, I could do that. And and that's where I really excelled at that. Bobby, at what point did you actually, uh, I, I don't know if the term come out is, is the right word, but when did the, did you start letting people know your family? Um, well, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, and I, and that, that's an important part. That's an important part. Um, uh, I remember very clearly the day I was probably about 12 years old and I was reading the Sunday Supplement Parade magazine in the Roanoke Times and I was looking at the letters to the editor and I, I say, I saw the four words that changed my life. 
in our in 1962, 1963, somewhere around. Those four words were Christine Jorgensen sex chain. And that was this letter to the editor that they were responding to an inquiry. And it was like, that was the first moment that I knew I wasn't the only person in the world. It felt like me. It was like, oh my God, because until that moment, 12, 13 years old, I thought I was the only one in the world. And, uh, and, and that, that was the moment my eyes were open. And so I got real, real, uh, obsessed with finding out everything I could about Christine Jorgensen, sex changes, going to the library, we had card catalogs and all that stuff back then. And, uh, the only things you could find were in medical journals or psych- psychological textbooks. And it was all under abnormal psychology, deviant behavior, sexual perversions. And uh, every once in a while, you could find something in a periodical. But I, until I was maybe 12 years old, I thought I was the only person in the world. And I didn't know what to do about it until that day. And I got a glimmer of hope. And I decided then, whatever Christine Torgitz did, I'm going to do that. <laughs> that, 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 that. Yes, it's like, I, I've got to do that. Uh, but I still had to live in secrecy because back then I'm in the buckle of the Bible Belt in this little town. There's no such thing as gender affirming here in that part of the world. Oh my God, nobody would have known. What we did know was queers. That was the only word we had in that part of the world. And it was taboo. And it was like, no, you don't want to be queer because, uh, you know, it's like that. it was just the most taboo thing. What was in my heart it was the most taboo thing in the world. And I couldn't speak to a soul about because uh, there was a mental institution in Stanton, Virginia, and that's where all the crazy people went. And if I knew if I really started talking about this in a big way, I, I, it was an abandonment issue. It was like that, that was the only place like they could have gotten any kind of treatment for me. Fast forward, I'm 25 years old, and I've got my first job, and I'm living. I've graduated college. I'm working in Lexington, Kentucky, and at that point, you know, I said I, I was maybe 12 years old when I first heard about Christine Jorgensen. 25 years old, I realized for half of my life, uh, I, I have been the loneliest person I know. It, it was bone crushing loneliness. I tried to kill myself because it just hurt. Up, up until that point, Bobby, there was no one in your life that was affirming or supportive that you could go to to say, you are okay, you're going to be okay. Not at all. Not at all. Not a single person. Just the opposite. Very punitive, uh, uh, very shaming, uh, you're very going to hell, uh, uh, all of that stuff. It, it was like, uh, uh, you know, uh, you breathe a word in this, you're going to this institution and you will have no control over it when you come back. Uh, uh, and so, um, so 25 years old and I, I've never had any close friends cause I had to keep everybody at arm's length because I couldn't let anybody in, uh, because you know, that I, uh, of all these imagined horrors that would happen if anybody knew this big deep dark secret. And so, um, my attempt failed and, uh, that made me kind of angry, but for some and I, I'd heard about a suicide and crisis hotline. I thought, well, we'll do this, call them. And, and that's who I came out to, uh, uh, to, to a suicide and crisis hotline. None of us knew what we were talking about. This was 1975. None of us knew what we were talking about back then. And, uh, and this person, you know, just we just mucked his way through it. But it was like, you know, if it was me, I just know I would have to talk to somebody about this. And so, that's what I decided to do. And so I, I had a small circle of really close friends that I tried to come out to. It was just a handful, two or three people. And that didn't really go well. Um, uh, back then, the, the idea was, well, you, you need to get married. You know, a good woman will, will straighten you out. And, and, uh, uh, and, I, and I found a good woman. And, uh, but I had the good sense to say, you need to know this about me. And uh, and we were just so both so young and stupid. It was like we just thought our great sex life was going to cure us, and and it was great for many months. But uh, but that it doesn't go away. 
and you cannot turn it off. Uh, and and uh, you try everything you can think of to make it, to turn it off. And there's a long story about all the things I've tried to do to to change my mind to match my body. Uh, but that's that was the prevailing wisdom at the time. You're going to change your mind to match your body. Uh, and um, and so anyhow, it just uh, uh, I was still living in the Bible Belt. And it was still real sinful. It was still. The, the AMA and the American Psychological Association didn't depathologize homosexuality until the winter of 1973. And they said, whoops, actually, that's just the, another part of the human condition. Uh, we're going to take that out of the DSM, whatever version they had then. It's not going to be sexual deviancy anymore. They did not do the same thing with being transgender until 2012. So until 2012, which is 11 years ago, we were still deviant sexual behavior. Wow, just uh, just over ten years ago. Yeah, yeah, and and that is when it's like, oops, we made a mistake. That that being transgender is also another, and and transgender people have existed forever, and uh, uh, and that's what I tell people. And uh, and I was part of a religious cult, and oh God, I had all of this internalized self loathing and uh, blah, blah, just all. The- uh, and, uh, but people are so, um, have so much flawed understanding about what the Bible actually says. And actually what I have done is when I'm talking to religious people, and this is the way I work through it, you know, I've always been told the Bible says you're either all male or all female. And there's nothing in between God that make any mistakes, yada, yada. That it never says that. <laughs> hmm. Once I started studying through that for myself, it was like, you know, start in the first chapter of Genesis. Let's create man in our image, male and female. So then here you got the creator of the universe. We're male and female. Uh, and Adam, the the day Adam was created, Adam was male and female. Uh, some ancient uh, art showed Adam with two faces. It was like that's the way it was. And um, and every fetus, every embryo begins as a female embryo. And nothing about X or Y chromosomes or S, R, Y genes even comes into play until like the sixth, seventh week of development. And that is exactly why men have nipples. And they also have this referee line that goes down the middle of their scrotum. <laughs> and it's like, that's where a vaginal canal would have formed if at week seven or eight that some of those hormonal factors hadn't started kicking in. And so it's like, everybody needs to understand and so the presumption is out of 8 billion people on the planet, there is no genetic way possible for any kind of variation in that. It just That's just stupid uh, because everybody begins as a female embryo and to assume that, they're, that everybody is hardwired and nothing can be. So I started, you know, I'm starting to think about this. Now I've got to go back and study the Bible. And then it's like, oh, my God, eunuchs. Eunuchs are people that are both and neither male or female. Jesus talks about them in Matthew 19 uh, and um, uh, and says, we did that on purpose. Some people are born eunuchs. And th- that just really opened my eyes. Uh, and, um, and, if, and that's why I identify as a eunuch when I talk to religious people, because the word eunuch is mentioned 45 times in the Bible, from the Old Testament to the book of Acts and Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And it's like, yes. People that are both and neither male and female have been with us since the beginning of the time in every culture all over the globe. It is part of the human condition. They're often celebrated in many cultures. They're they're like the diplomats or the the medicine or the healers or negotiators, uh, uh, the the people that intervene that care for families and caretakers. Uh, they've existed for since the beginning of time, and I am one of those. I'm one of those people who was born wired differently, and it's taken me a long time to come to peace with all of that. Bobby, I have a quick a, a quick question for you, and we may come back to this a little bit later, but one of the narratives going around now with all of the controversy about transgender students in particular is that, um, you know, schools are uh, kind of uh, promoting or encouraging this, and that it's... Uh, one person told me that I ran into... 
he said it's sort of like tattoos it's a fad and and kids are just sort of uh, trying this out and what what i hear from your story and other uh, stories from transgender people is the uh, the profound level of pain that you experienced uh, because of where you lived and people didn't know about it, the loneliness you described, self-loathing. Um, and then we haven't even gotten to the parts where we talk about uh, physical changes you went through. And and then just the, the, the social uh, implications of it. It just makes me believe that the pain of not changing, not transitioning, has got to be greater than all those things I just listed. And if it wasn't, then people, fewer people would do it. Is is that reasonable to yeah, think that? Thank, thank you. It's really good to hear another human being like, I can't wait that because when I tell people, and it's the biggest myth, the greatest myth, and that's why I encourage people to get to know their neighbors, you will never, never, never meet somebody who chose to be transgender. I couldn't say that any more emphatically mm. or clearly. Being transgender chooses us. If you think I would choose this misery, <laughs> I, it's like, no, no. It's and People say, well, why would a man want to become a woman? Well, a man wouldn't want to become a, a, a woman. Only another female person would put up with all of that crap to, to, to finally realize who they are. And so I say, you will never meet a person who chose to be transgender. All we ever chose was who we were going to tell about it. That's all we ever choose. And it's the same way when you get into sexual orientation. And if you really start getting to talk to gay people, it's like they've always had a same sex attraction. It's like they didn't choose that. That's just the way they were wired. And so here I've spent 47 years working with neurodivergent people. And it's like, yes, of course, uh, gender identity and sexual orientation it's like people have no problem uh, accepting that some people are born with autism or some people are born with um, uh, seizure disorders or some people are born with Down syndrome. Uh, and, and it's like, oh, yeah, of course, people you know. Yeah, people's brains and bodies can be wired all over the place. Why is it so hard to imagine that gender identity and sexual orientation don't, aren't subject to that same kind of diversity? And it is. That's a simple truth. It is. Uh, people do not choose uh, their their sexual orientation or their gender identity. And, and Bobby, when it does happen, uh, I remember you telling me when we spoke earlier that you mentor and counsel parents whose children want to transition. And I was struck by something you said, um, which was that you there's a grieving process that parents go through. Talk talk a little bit about that. I find that really fascinating. Absolutely. You know, I, I just, I'm so grateful and feel so blessed to be in my life and to have opportunity to, to create a world where children don't have to grow up in misery like I did. And so I'm really involved. I'm real involved with parent organizations and groups like PFLAG and Transparenting, uh, the Louisville Youth Group in our town. Uh, I, I, I work with the Office of uh, Diversity, Equity, and Poverty for our public schools, and I've trained nearly every principal and counselor over the last eight years. It's, I've worked on it every month for eight years, training all the counselors and principals because parents come to counselors and principals, and what are we going to do? And and so I've, I've trained them all. And so, yeah, I'm up my eyeballs in working in youth mental health. Um, and um, and and I get that with parents because I'm a parent myself. I've got four kids. They're all grown I've got 10 grandchildren, and uh, and I get that because you uh, say you have a daughter and you give them a name that probably means a lot to you. You, you name them after somebody famous in your family or somebody that was really influential, and you give them this name, and, and you cannot help every night when you put them to bed to imagine what tomorrow is going to be like and, and to play that out. And see them with their friends and start wondering, like, you know, uh, are they ever going to fall in love? And, and, and you project all kinds of future stuff onto those children. And then one day they come and say, Mommy, I think I'm a guy. 
and I can't do this anymore. And it ha- and it can happen in kindergarten. I want I'll, people have got to understand that children, it's not a fad. It is not a fad. It is misery. And and children, uh, it's it's like it's not it's not a fad. It's just children aren't afraid to talk about it anymore. And that's something I didn't have. I was paralyzed with fear as a child. I couldn't talk about it. Uh, but children aren't afraid anymore. And that's all that's going on. It's not a fad. It's just children aren't afraid anymore. And so the parent, you know, it's like you, there's all kinds of reasons why, you know, it, you want to give this child the life you never had and the future that you've never had. And you've projected all of this stuff. And all of a sudden they say, I'm not, that's not who I am. And I want you to start calling me this. And oh, that that's crushing to a parent because they put so much thought and soul and feeling into that name that they gave them. And it's like, and it's not good enough. It's not working anymore. I don't want to be that. Uh, that's hard to deal with. And 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 it, just if you were just, uh, you know, and it's funny when 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 moms are pregnant uh, and you talk to them, it's like, I don't care if it's a boy or a girl. I just want to be healthy. No, and I'd say, please remember that because you really didn't care if they were a boy or a girl at one point. Uh, and now they're telling you, <laughs> guess what, mom? Uh, that's not the way it's going to be. And that's, that's really hard on everybody involved. It's really hard on everybody involved. But the, the, the kids are living in misery and, and, um, and so there's all kinds of things that go in that even if you're a supportive parent that loves your baby and you really don't care if they're a boy or a girl, it's like you start thinking, oh, baby, you, this is a hurtful world that you live in. You're going to be bullied to death. You're going to be teased to death. You're making your life 10 times harder. And, and there's some parents that try to resist because they know their child is, is aspiring to this world of hardship. and. Uh, uh, and 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 really, t- a lot of tough obstacles to overcome if you really want to realize this. And so, some parents they love their kids, they want to be supportive, but they want to spare them from the pain. And so, there's that that's going on. And then there's some parents that are. It's like, no, you can't do this. We got to change your mind. Uh, and and so they subject their kids to all kinds of torture and all this stuff. Or they think, oh my God, you can't do this. What will the neighbors say? And and that is more important to them than their child's happiness. It's like what the neighbors think. And so there's that kind of grief turned into uh, kind of a harsh, non-supportive sort of thing. Uh, and, and people are going to tough love their kids and make them homeless or whatever they've got to do to just beat this out of them. And, and that's another way that grief looks. If I think about, you know, I'm a uh, parent and if I... I thought that a child of mine was uh, wanting to change his or her name. Uh, it would be really hard for the reasons you described. And and I was mostly thinking about the second set of reasons about what hell they're going to go through out in the world. I mean, even if I said, boy, I can tell you would be happier that way, I would worry and, and, and have to grieve a bit about uh, what kind of life... Uh, but but also I think for the reasons that you said that I hadn't thought about is that I I projected something onto my child and had expectations and 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 visions of what they would be doing and who they would be with. And now that, you know, at five years old or twelve years, whenever it happens, and I so it would be really hard. And I appreciate your saying that you that parents need support in in making that transition themselves. Um, but I have to believe that what's going on today is that uh, many parents out there that don't understand uh, many of the things that you've studied and experienced yourself are feeling like what schools are doing is making it totally fine and pushing people to simply explore other you know, gender options. When I think what I've noticed is that schools are, uh, to their credit, are being more accepting of people. And, and you know, as, as some have said, you know, we're the, oftentimes the first uh, 
uh, area of support where someone who say is an LGBTQ student can come and get some feeling of uh, acceptance and care and love because they're not getting it elsewhere. And 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 um, I want to uh, just uh, get your opinion about uh, one of the policies that's being adopted around the country. And I think there are now three or four districts in California where the school districts have adopted these parental disclosure laws and sort of part of these parental rights movement. And and the way they work uh, is that, that educators are required uh, if they hear a student of theirs or any student uh, wanting to be called with a different name or different pronoun than their birth gender, that they have to inform the parents. Now, there's one district that said, well, yeah, we've heard that that, that could result in some problems. So we will ask the child first if they feel uh, they would be unsafe. And if the child says yes, then they report it to CPS. So they sort of feel like, well, we've taken care of that by just making sure that they feel safe. But I want to think CPS is going to do what they, they can't ignore the, that situation. The, mm -hmm. Some parents are going to find out now through CPS. So what do you... Uh, what what do you think the the consequence of of these laws and policies I should say are are going to be for trans kids? Well, um, you know it's funny um, the dynamic that's going on in these state legislatures is you've got these blueberry cities <laughs> uh, in every state that are liberal democratic strongholds, but then these big the, the whole rest of the state that's rural and Republican. And um, and they can't understand what's going on. Uh, you know, I I teach teachers, and I teach teachers all over this, all over the country, really, all over the world. But uh, but uh, some of them uh, l live in rural districts, and and having cultural diversity experience uh, with with kids that don't look like them is hard to come by. And it's not their fault. There's just nothing but white people in this county. And it's, they, you know, and so I'm trying to get them to have all these culturally diverse experiences. In Louisville, in the Jefferson County schools, we speak 152 languages. And I want people to wrap their head around that. We've got one Klondike Elementary School where they speak 63 languages in that one elementary school. And I want parents to try to understand, no, we are not all white, rural, evangelical, Christian, far right. We are not all like that. You do not live in that world. Uh, Same-sex marriage is a law of the land now. You have children in the schools that have two mommies or they've got two daddies. That's the way it's been. They, they are more loved than ever. It's like that is life. Uh, and so I, I want to, teachers, teachers aren't grooming children and they aren't doing lesson plans on gender and identity and sexuality. They've got their hands full teaching formulas and algebra. They've got their hands full teaching sentence structures, that word endings and prefixes and, you know, chemistry and the periodic. They've got their hands full and it's all they can do to just meet their state standards. What teachers do every day is in their classroom. If there's a kid that had been wearing the same clothes for four days and now they're getting teased because somebody notices they stink and they're wearing and it's like so the class is ganging up on the kid. What's a teacher supposed to do? They're going to defend that kid. You've got a kid that um, they're taking, they're asking people in the cafeteria on Friday, it's like, do you, do you want that banana? Would you mind? And, and they're, they're starting to hoard food on Fridays. They get teased for hoarding food on Fridays because they're not going to have any over the weekend. What's a teacher supposed to do when those kids are getting bullied? Uh, it's it's the same thing with with kids that are fat and kids that have got funny hairstyles, or uh, or kids that have two mommies, or kids that have. What's a teacher supposed to do when the bullying starts? And you know, you expect your teachers to take a bullet for your kids. You think a gunman's going to rush into school, and you expect a teacher to take a bullet for your kids. How do you not expect them to defend the kid that's getting bullied to death because they're different? And if I ever taught a thing about gender identity or sexual orientation, it was under those conditions because some kid was being, and they're saying, oh, you're a fag. 
what am I supposed to do when kids yells across the room? Oh, he's a fag and everybody starts laughing. What am I supposed to do? You know, and I want to ask parents, what do you want me to do? Join in with them and say, oh, you're right, you're a fag. Let's all have a good laugh on that. No, that is not going to happen. It's unethical as it can be. And so if you accuse me of teaching gender identity and sexual orientation, those are the only conditions where anything about that topic may ever come out of my mouth. And so the other thing you mentioned, Ken, was just um, schools being a safe place. Uh, the superintendent of the, the, the public schools in Louisville, Dr. Marty Polio, um, was a high school principal uh, uh, at a school close to my home and uh, really distinguished himself there before he was named the superintendent. And I was talking to him about this because I trained teachers and counselors in our public schools. I've trained every one of them over the last eight years about transgender and, and queer issues. And, uh, and, and he told me that in his office at Doss High School, he had one of those Glisten Safe Place rainbow stickers. Uh, and meaning if you were a queer kid, my office is a safe place where you can talk to me. And his whole thing there was as simple as this. If a kid doesn't feel like they belong at school, they're not going to learn anything anyway. And nothing could be more true than that. If a kid doesn't feel like they belong in school, they're not going to learn anything. And you can't expect them to learn anything if they're being bullied, if they're being harassed, if they're being made fun of. And if there's not a teacher saying, not in my room, <laughs> you are not going to talk that way to anybody in my room. You're not going to scream fag at them as soon as they walk in the door. You're not going to make fun of their clothes. You're not going to do that in my classroom. If they're poor and they stink, if they're hungry because they got no food, you will not disrespect any child in my classroom. I am not going to tolerate that. If they're a least bit effeminate or they're, a, you know, just a big old pearly tomboy, it's like you are not going to make fun of them based on their physical characteristics in my classroom. That's not happening. My room is a safe place and we're going to respect each other. Bobby, tell me this. I imagine there's a parent out there listening to this and they say, I want, you know, the school will call me if my student is not doing well on a subject or they're struggling or, uh, you know, if they've been bullied or something. Um, and if my child is uh, expressing an interest in transitioning, I want to know about it. I have a right to know about it. And if you don't tell me, as one uh, parent uh, told me, you're lying to me. You're keeping this really critical information. So that's what has given rise to these policies that say you have to call the parents. So what, what is your response to, to that? Well, that's a great question. And I go back to, it doesn't matter if you're five years old or 15 years old. The question is, who are the trusted adults in your life? And it's a shame if your parents aren't included in that number. The most sensitive, the most personal, the most vulnerable part of your soul, you cannot talk to your parents about that. So who is the most trusted adult in your life? Chances are really good it's your favorite. Now, where's the problem there? The problem is with the parents uh, who have, you know, who have put out this barrier where their kids are terrified, their kids will be. I mean, really, you talk to children, their dads have beat them within an inch of their life. Uh, they they have been put out on the streets. Uh, I, I mean, they know where this is going. And so who are the trusted adults? And so that is what's going on. And the, the dilemma is you get a kid that comes, I've had them come into my classroom and they want to talk to me about trans being transgender and and what I do is as I, I just as a matter of policy and because of all this stuff and because I'm working in a hospital setting so I'm so glad that you felt comfortable enough to tell me about this let me tell you what I'll do if you'll go talk to your therapist and tell them you talk to me and both of you come back in here at some point I'd be happy to talk to you. but I am I am not going to talk to this kid in isolation about anything like that. 
I will talk to them in the presence of their parents or the therapist. I'm not going to talk to them alone. And that's, that's been my, that, my mode of operation forever. It seems to me that one of the things that will happen very quickly is that students will make sure that if they are using other names and pronouns, um, that they don't do it around teachers or anyone who could hear them, or they just won't do it at all around anybody. They'll go back into the closet and it'll be like it has been for eons. Uh, and it will seem like, oh, we just solved that problem because no one is getting calls anymore. But it, it just masking the fact that people aren't people. Are, we've pushed these kids back in the closet. And the other thing you alluded to, the fact that there are, you you would urge people to go talk to a therapist. Well, I think we all accept and have for years accepted the fact that when our kids go and talk to a counselor, uh, the counselor tells kids, unless there are certain things that you might bring up, what you tell me is going to be confidential. And we accept that. And we, uh, as a parent, say, boy, if you really need to talk to someone to get advice and support, I understand why they wouldn't be able, they wouldn't be allowed to contact me unless there was something that um, you, you were going to do harm or you had to bring the, the parents in. Now, I think therapists would also say, have you spoken to your parents? Or it would be terrific, wouldn't it, if we could get support from parents and maybe I could help with that. But there are going to be some kids that say, Absolutely not. I, I know what they would do and I know what they would say. And so please don't tell them. Uh, so it's a real dilemma for people. But again, I, I think part of the narrative going around now is that uh, it's it's a fad. There are all these people thinking, oh, I, I think tomorrow I'm just going to try out being uh, the opposite gender uh, because that's kind of a cool thing to do. And I, I think what you're saying over and over and over again, this is not a choice. No, and I and I think gender dysphoria is is a clinical name. I think it's the most uh, misunderstood, most maddening, most debilitating, most deadly condition. One of the most that that a human can endure. And I've said this thousands of times. I would not wish gender dysphoria on my worst enemy. And I mean that. I cannot think of a person in the world history. That is evil enough that I would wish this on. Uh, it was. It would never be anything that I would choose for myself. Uh, but but here we are, and um, that's what I I need people to understand. There's no choice about this. No fan. It's just kids aren't scared anymore. And the other thing I want to be sure to mention is some states have doubled down on this point, and and in Kentucky with Senate Bill 150, uh, we have legalized misgendering students because the idea being, well, if I call them by this name or if I use these pronouns, I'm just feeding their sin. I'm feeding their mental illness. So I'm not going to do it. The right thing for me to do is to dead name them and to humiliate them in front of all of their friends. I, 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 their mental health is bad now. Wait till I get through. And so they have, they have legalized misgendering in my state, and that's spreading all over this country, too. And they've, they've also uh, uh, precluded uh, having any guidance from your uh, school superintendent, school board, or State Department of Education. To the contrary, uh, there's no consequences for misgendering a student. And, uh, and I'm telling you, that is, I, I work with suicidal children. I need people to understand that. I need people to understand these kids have got scars all over their arms where they're trying everything they know to kill themselves. And I'm not making this up. I'm not I'm not quoting some kind of statistics that I read about in a psychology journal. I'm I've had kids cut themselves in my classroom. I had a kid, this was in my early days. I, I had a two page handout. We were gonna work on for reading and I stapled it together. And this little girl she was a sixth grade girl. She took the staple out of my handout. She had her hands inside her desk working that staple to cut herself, her arm. And I didn't notice until I saw blood on the floor. Something was going on. That's what I want people to understand, how miserable and desperate these children are. I am not 
quoting a bunch of statistics. It's very personal. And that's why I'm doing it, because these kids are miserable. 47 years I have worked with neurodivergent kids, uh, adults with developmental delays on it. I have worked with the most fragile, vulnerable people in our country every day for 47 years. And I just, I challenge people to check my record. There is not a whisper, not a whisper, a hit of anything inappropriate. What do you think I'm doing? What do you think I'm doing when you project all of this stuff on me? And that is really what the problem is. People cannot imagine a gender identity or sexual orientation outside of what they know. And so they go, what would have to be wrong with me in order for me to act like that? And so they project all of this psychosis on it. It's like, well, I'd really have to be a, a pedophile. That's it. I would really have to be a pedophile in order to act like that. And so they project that onto us. Or they they or they or they want to be a peeping Tom. They say, oh, I really want to be a peeping Tom. That's why I want to get into the women's bathroom. Because I really want to. And, and so they project all of this sinful, dark stuff on themselves. They could, what would have to be wrong with me to act like that? And they just cannot accept that some people are just wired differently. So as I think, what's the way out? What's the way forward in these divided times? I think it's not going to come through protests at school board meetings. I think it only causes people to dig in their heels. It's going to come by listening to people like you and you listening and, and talking with people who have concerns. And so 